started doing that in 1991 during HIV care, and I still do that today. So I basically have 25 years to spend the, uh, uh, one half day out in the clinic um, doing HIV work. And we found early on that it was quite amazing that 50% of all the HIV positive tests back in 1991 were coming from the state correctional system. On one hand, that's like, wow, incredible, and an amazing place to, for potential entry to care. On the other hand, that's really dreadful. Um, not just because of the burden, but also because it shows there's more tests in the community. I mean, for someone to be newly diagnosed with the correctional center is really pretty dreadful. It turns out some of that was an aberration because they were, uh, they included multiple tests. Those were the days of anonymous, not just anonymous HIV testing, but where there was no reporting of HIV. Uh, no name reporting and unique identifier reporting of HIV. And, uh, you know, it's always interesting to look at history. I and mean, I remember going to our community forum saying to folks, guys, we have to have accurate HIV reporting. Because I've been sitting here at the ACI where they've been reporting all these HIV diagnoses as if they're new, and they're not. And this creates a huge aberration. Nobody's tracking the, really not just the epidemic, but they don't really care about really infected folks. They're worried about their funding. So they're inflating their numbers. And we really need to know new infections. So the CDC was the one that really pushed name reporting, which changed that. You know, in my 30 years of HIV work, I've not had a single breach of confidentiality that I know of from the Department of Health or the Department related to the CDC Department of Health Network. You know, I've seen it within our medical system, I've seen it in the community. We care providers are not terribly good at it, but it's not come from DOH or CDC. And so that was, you know, really interesting. So we started out doing that, and then we said, wait a second. We started publishing about it, and we started working, and then we realized, wait a second, our patients within the jail and the prison are really no different than our patients um, on the outside. And this is a unique opportunity to really reach out to folks that are otherwise hidden, they're under the radar screen. And that's really the big take home message, which is, you know, you think you want to work with marginalized communities, you want to work with folks that are hard to reach, that's all the lingo we use in our grants. But if you don't step foot within the correctional system, you're going to miss a huge segment of it. Also, our stereotypes don't hold true. You know, we say, well, I want to go work with IDUs. I'll go work with the correctional system. You know, I want to go work with MSM. I'll go work with the two bathhouses in Providence. I'll go work with our bathhouses and uh, link there. It doesn't work that way. You know, substance abuse is equal opportunity, cuts across um, all different risk groups and all different profiles. We were involved in the early HBTN study, the Vaccine Trials uh, Prevention Network, and they did a vaccine preparedness study, and the number one correlate of new HIV infections, whether it was heterosexual, whether it was homosexual, um, across the board was at that time um, cocaine use. And it was really interesting how that cut across, and it wasn't injection cocaine, it was crack. Um, you know, different communities and stuff, they see methamphetamines, different stimulants, but it was really substance abuse, which was the number one correlate of a uh, new HIV infection. So that, and you know, so prison is where you see not just substance users, it's where you see the most disenfranchised, um, in some ways the most hopeless, because obviously they're there to be um, punished by society, and the, the cruelness of the system, as most of you know, is pretty, pretty dreadful. So a lot of this, um, this is a slide from India where we've done some work in southern India. This is Mysore. Interesting enough, this is a commercial sex worker. And there you can be imprisoned with your children. And that's quite a remarkable thing. And at first gas, you go, ooh. On the other hand, it's remarkable how humanizing it is. And, and you know, it's, that's an interesting philosophical, ethical issue that we're not used to in this country. But in some ways it may be more humane. But this is a Time Magazine when Ronald Reagan was president. I mean, just phenomenal. When you think how long mass incarceration has been going on for. You guys have seen this, but we incarcerate more people per capita than really any other developed nation. It's really absolutely <coughs> horrendous. And of course, part of this is the industrial correctional complex. And you have heavy amounts of lobbying, you have the private correctional industry, you have the unions at work. We had a big effort in Rhode Island to try and, and promote home confinement. And the unions put up a huge billboard right on 95, which said, 
do you want this person, you know, living next to you? And of course, it was somebody who, you know, was dragging his knuckles on the concrete pavement and had a big ankle bracelet and just looked scared. And it was, you know, all scare tactics by the union, and it worked. It was really a sad thing. And where you've got the private correctional industry driving the growth of prisons, just look at California, um, it's really, it's really dreadful. At this point, it's bankrupting, you know, much of the country. And that's one of the primary impetuses for us to try and reform our correctional justice system to try and save money. A lot of it happened with the war on drugs and with the sentencing, and um, which drove this just massive incarceration rate, <laughs> which we're familiar with. We also, most of us recognize that this is really predominantly persons of color, and that the disproportionate incarceration rates among African Americans is really just off the charts. And um, this is, uh, you know, it becomes a culture. And the culture is, is really hard to break. And the ramifications in different communities are absolutely um, huge. So I'm an infectious disease doctor. So I'm not corrections. You know, I don't go, I'm not, that's not where I'm at. I'm really infectious diseases. And what drove our work was just this incredible burden of infectious diseases. And this is AIDS rates back in 1997. 16% of all the cases of AIDS were in the correctional system. HIV was, you know, up 20, a fifth to a quarter of all cases, but chronic hepatitis B, chronic hepatitis C. I mean, in Rhode Island, we have a huge burden of hepatitis C, and the uh, burgeoning population of hepatitis C is, you know, really explosive. And the problem is now that our therapies are just so incredibly expensive. This is a challenge for us with our grants because we've been quite successful and many, many other sites as well in linking individuals to care for HIV. But we've not been able to do it successfully for hepatitis C. The NIH is not funding it. This is, of course, the elephant in the room is the cost of therapies, which has really been driven by Gilead's price of Harvoni for you know $100,000 for a 12-week course, just absolutely off the charts. The cost is gonna start dropping very dramatically. And that will probably happen over the next three to five years, which is way too long. But still, that will happen. And when that happens, the question is, can we take the whole HIV paradigm and apply it to hepatitis C? So will treatment result in prevention? Is treatment prevention? We don't know. It's going to be fascinating to see. With you know um, communities that have really been effective at needle distribution, you know, where we saw incredible drops in HIV rate, and I'll show you that in Rhode Island. What about hepatitis C? And hepatitis C has fallen. New epidemic among MSM that we're seeing, and, it, and that's a little bit selective as well. It appears to be due to really um, the, the cumulative um, anal intercourse that's occurring, probably due to blood, blood exposure. And that's related in new cases of hepatitis C that are not being diagnosed. And then different communities that are shifting their drug use where you're seeing different explosions of hep C. Um, and then TB. We don't have a lot of TB, but we still have higher rates within the correctional system um, and a higher burden of disease. So this is an update of that slide. That, was, that work was done by Ted Hammett, who was funded by the National Institutes of Justice, and this was 1997. Here we are in 2005. And it's down, you can't see it, I'm sorry, I should change this. This is 14%. This is 19%. So this is HIV and AIDS burden. <coughs> you know, it's still huge. It's like massive. If you look at the outcomes, people in corrections are doing well with HIV because our therapy is so good and quite simple. In fact, in the state of New York, your outcomes in terms of HIV care are better within the state prison than they are within the community at large because why you're in prison. And so, you know, you get much better adherence. I wouldn't say that about Rikers Island necessarily because of the chaos that goes on there in its short term, but this is still a really huge burden of disease. So really, really um, enormous. You know, stigma is also the elephant in the room because stigma, and whether it's internalized or externalized, stigma is magnified within the correctional setting to just an enormous degree. I mean, the goal of corrections is punishment. You walk in through those correctional gates, the door slams behind you, behind you, the correctional officers treat you terribly, the atmosphere is oppressive, 
it is humiliating and it is difficult. So if you weren't stigmatized before, um, you will be afterwards. I mean, it is just, it, you know, it is, it is, it is huge. And, you know, we talk a lot about sort of the impact of stigma, but I think the, I like to use terminology which is not very clinical. And, you know, it's this whole question of hopelessness and worthlessness and being helpless, hopeless. And why is it that individuals become accustomed to the correctional system and that helpless hopelessness that occurs, which is really profound and hard, really hard to penetrate and really critically important. And after doing this for 25 years, you know, we're always working at the, at the margin. We're always trying to help folks that want to help themselves. But you always run across individuals that just, you're, you, you know, it's really, you're looking for that spark and, and it really is related to the stigma that occurs. We have another challenge, which is if you put in your NIH grant on stigma, you're gonna have a really hard time getting it funded. And I'll kind of pepper what I talk related to sort of NIH and our success. And the reason for it is stigma harkens back to our work and our grants from the 1980s and 1990s and the early 2000s. And the NIH really rewrote their whole priorities. So if you go to the NIDA website, and if you go to the NIH Office of AIDS Research, you will find their high priority areas, their middle priority areas, and their low priority areas. And we just had a, a K award um, from a fellow who's doing BU, doing great work up at, um, in Ukraine. They got a great score, and they held funding, they weren't going to fund it, because it was all related to stigma. And what you have to do is you have to take all of our concern, our work, the literature on stigma, and you've got to relate it to the care continuum. And if you look at the United Priorities, it ties right into the care continuum. And part of the care continuum is engagement and viral load suppression. And whether and that care continuum works for HIV prevention as well, because it relates to you've got to be doing serial HIV testing, you've got to do STI testing, and for those folks that are negative or continue to be high risk, you can enter them into the prep care continuum world. And that, of course, you have to continue to do STD. Sorry, you have to do HIV testing, otherwise you're going to be giving people PrEP for a true infection. That's not going to work. Um, so the care continuum with hard endpoints is how I really recommend you translate this, which, which appropriately drives so much of what we do, translates that to get your grants funded. So you really want to bring it back and talk about my endpoint is going to be... Um, but HIV, hepatitis C, syphilis testing, every blank, and make your windows wide. Because if you're dealing with real people in and out of prison, we don't, I don't care if they're late for their testing. I just care if they get testing. You know, there's no, they, they don't have to do it according to our schedule. It can be according to their schedule. So make your windows wide, but you've got to relate to the NIH priorities. But we, this is really important because this is so much of what gets at the heart of the matter. So, you know, HIV testing, you know, and the really is obviously about ethics. In 19, what drove the HIV care program in our correctional system was the state mandating HIV testing. And they said, we're going to offer it routinely. It's going to be opt out. Well, we did a study um, where we went and we asked inmates that had been released. And we asked those that are HIV positive, and we asked those that were diagnosed in prison, we asked those that are HIV negative. And we did it in the methadone maintenance program. So folks that have been incarcerated, we said, is routine testing in the prison, is it voluntary or is it mandatory? 75% of them said it's mandatory. So the perception is it's mandatory. Okay, then we asked them, what do you think? Is it good for that it's mandatory or not? That's kind of interesting as well. Most of us, for good reasons, don't like mandatory testing. Um, but it's important to ask the people that are being tested. You know, it's not really what we think sitting at Lincoln Center, but what they think. And uh, so we asked them, 75% said, oh no, it's definitely the way it should be, 100%. But 25% said no. There really needs to, people need to be able to opt out and we need to respect the autonomy involved in that, but and it's, that's not perceived. So, um, so that's what it was. We've actually since been, that we've changed that. Now it's routine opt out if you're incarcerated. Um, and we have other problems, which is that folks that are just in jail are not, many of them are not offered routine testing the way we should, but it's got to start with testing. And if you're not going to be testing, it's not going to work very well. This is interesting. 
This is North Philadelphia, right by Temple. And if you go to Philadelphia, which has the fourth highest number of AIDS cases in the United States, you know, I say AIDS, I think, you know, New York City. New York City is always number one. New York City. Um, you know, then I might think, uh, you know, Atlanta, or I'll think Miami, or I'll think San Francisco, I'll think LA. Turns out Philly is really big. And these are all African-American leaders. This was work done by Amy Nunn, um, who said they all got tested and they put this up on the billboard. So the impact and the power of testing is extraordinary. I just mentioned because we often forget. And if we're, and that's another way you grant, I think you're gonna have a terrible time. You know, if you're doing HIV prevention and are not incorporating hardcore testing, um, you know, it, it, I don't think you're going to get very far in this day and age. So, um, why are correctional institutions important targets? Well, obviously, we just talked about this. Huge number of individuals, five times the general population. 90% of people in corrections are men. 10% are women, but of the 10% that are there, the women that, but among women, they have a higher prevalence rate of HIV than men. And this is really one of the only settings in, the, in, in our, not overseas, not in Sub-Saharan Africa. But this is one of the only settings in America where women have a higher prevalence rate. Why? Um, we've always said, because though I haven't ever seen it quantified, because the burden of substance abuse among women is much higher than it is among men. You tend to be a much more intensive injection drug user, much more intensive um, crack, have much more intensive crack addiction. You have much more intensive substance abuse. And it, that, you know, men can get into, get incarcerated for violent behavior that may have, where substance use may be peripheral, whereas women, it tends to be really much more central. And, and, and so that, it's the intensity of substance abuse, which you think relates to it. The geographic distribution is really important. Um, and geography, geography, geography. I mean, you know, this is really critically important in terms of HIV. Um, and it is really with all our infectious diseases. So doing geospatial mapping, looking at the burden within really communities, not just at the state, not just at the city, but at the census tract level. Mapping your census tract level burden of HIV with your census tract burden of incarceration, with your census tract burden of opiate overdose. You know, really looking at it at a community, a community at a micro community level, critically important. But just, I mean, this data is unbelievable. You know, oh, we're in Rhode Island doing great correctional work. You know, hello, you know, you guys are teeny weeny weeny. This is, this is where the, you know, where the real problems are. Um, you know, obviously most people that are in, and it's what a challenge when people get out, linking folks to primary care, critically important. When we were involved in one of the early studies of HIV among women, we found that being in committed primary care actually was preventive in terms of incarceration. We obviously don't think it's causative, but we think it's an association. And the reason is that being in committed primary care, you both have more access to services, you are more empowered in order to access the services, you're more aware. But the bottom line is, this is really such a key place to promote and initiate health interventions. So important to do. So. The CDC funded a bunch of new HIV testing programs. Um, this was back in uh, around the early 2000s. And you can see this is Washington, New York, Baltimore, and Philadelphia. And this is the number of folks, the number tested, the percent within each system that were tested. And even with a concerted effort, Washington DC got up to 68% of folks coming into their jail. This was jail testing. But New York City, Rikers here was only 26%, Philadelphia was only 32%, Baltimore 84%. And so much of it really relates to the will and the buy-in of the entire system to make it happen. And then this is the percent newly diagnosed. By and large, there is about another, about a same, same number, about another, you know, it was about, it was almost exact, about half the folks that tested positive were newly diagnosed, the other half, had not identified as being HIV positive, but were previously diagnosed. And we don't, we often don't think the value of routine HIV testing programs in different settings can be to pick up folks that are test HIV positive, but just never acknowledge it, 
um, haven't accepted it, have never been into care, have denied it, are um, might know it and just might be hopeless about it. For whatever reason, you're picking up folks that have fallen totally through the cracks in terms of the HIV care continuum. So this was considered um, very successful. The problem was then institutionalizing testing, how to make it truly routine within the system. And it's been a big challenge and systems have been, it's been highly variable. And a lot of it depends on the funding and the political level. Uh, was the testing upon entry into the prison it was upon system? entry. Okay. And it was to jail. Okay. So, so we'll go through the data. As you, you know, in Rhode Island, we have 10 times more folks going through the jail mm -hmm. than are incarcerated longer term. So oh. jail is where you go when you're driving down the highway, they stop you and they don't like the way they look, you look, or you've been a rep, you had a speeding ticket six years before and you never paid it. Mm -hmm. um, where, I mean, these things do happen. It really does happen. We had a guy who was stopped on 95. They said, well, there's a felony out. You've had a felony commitment. I said, well, where was that? He said, that was in Oklahoma. I said, I've never, the guy said, I have never been to Oklahoma in my entire life. I said, well, that's very interesting, but you're still coming with us to the ACI. Right, because they look at her computer record, your name and date of birth is there. His wallet had been stolen. Oh. The guy who had taken his license and committed a felony and said, this is who I am. He sees that. <laughs> he then gets tested for HIV. He's newly diagnosed positive. The real but guy, not the, the real guy. Monster. Yeah, the real guy. I mean, really, you know, these, it's, it can be quite, um, be very careful. So jail is where you go when you're picked up and you're, in, you're, you're right away put behind bars. Mm -hmm. And then many systems, they'll say you'll be in jail for, even if you're sentenced, if your sentence is anywhere is six months or less or 12 months or less. Mm -hmm. So you can have a very short term incarceration in jail. Prison is where you go once you're sentenced in Rhode Island if you're sentenced for any significant period of time. Other places you're sentenced for more than six months or a year. Okay. And those are people that can be sentenced for, you know, we've got one of our inmates who said to him the other day, I said, you know, gosh, you know, uh, I said, how long are you in for? He's in maximum security. I said, oh, Dr. Flanagan, I told you, you shouldn't be asking me that. So then, yeah, we finished taking care of him. I said, Pat, don't listen to this. Oh, she said, you don't remember. She said, he's in for five life sentences. So he was 19 years old, and he was with another guy, another guy who was a drug deal, had gone, had, had never been paid off from a drug deal, and the other guy, sort of got, you know, wrapped him in on this, and they went and said, I'm going to get that guy back again. Went to the, uh, one of the tenement buildings, put gasoline around it, lit it on fire, five people died. Of course, the guy involved the drug deal wasn't there at all. So five, uh, five totally other people that had nothing to do with it, you know, would die. Wow. And so that's why five life sentences. And do they test any time after uh, arrival? So general? some systems will test you come in and test when you leave. Okay. Now there are two thoughts behind that. Why would you do that? One, you do it either A, you're in the window period, because if you you know, if you're going to jail, you may have been involved in very high risk activity. On the other hand, a lot of us are using now the Abbott fourth generation test, which is an antigen antibody test. And the window period for that test is really very narrow. Days, days. So the chances of having that acute infection are really very, very, very small. Most DOH's Department of Health have incorporated the Abbott fourth generation in, um, so that and there's, that's part of the advantage of that. The other is, well, obviously having sex or injecting in prison, and therefore becoming infected in prison and diagnosing it when you leave. There was uh, 20 individuals that uh, were, um, by history, thought to have been infected within the correctional system in Georgia, for example. Been a number of very good studies being done, both in LA and then another part of the CDC funded study that we were part of, which was ourselves, Wisconsin, Mississippi, and California. And in that study, we looked at risk taking behaviors behind bars and risk taking behaviors outside and looked for HIV, serum conversion. And every study has shown that the rates of risk behavior outside are many, many, many fold higher than inside. So unprotected sex does occur, but it generally occurs to a much lower degree. Is it a problem? Of course it's a problem. And it's a little tricky because sex within prison is coercive or manipulative. 
you you know it, it's very hard. We have the we have kind of our own narrative about sex being you know consensual and sex within prison is a very odd structure. So you know obviously any rape any but even coercive sex it's, it's so so there shouldn't be any unprotected sex where anybody's at risk. But it's hard to know that the paradigms are a little tricky. So anyway, it's it's an issue, but um, that's important. This is uh, Rhode Island. This is the uh, maximum security. Sort of looks at. This is a buddy of mine, Kirk Beckwith, who's also got, interesting enough, he's got an R25 from NIDA that does just related to correctional work. Okay, so we looked, this was back in um, a five year, a seven year period. And at that time, 50% of all the new diagnoses in the state were from our correctional system. Um, and here's the breakdown men and women. Um, here's the age. Pretty, a lot of older folks. You know, a lot of our, our HIV epidemic is aging, but you're going to find a lot of older folks within the correctional system, which is pretty wild. Um, tends to be very diverse. This is Rhode Island, but still, this is very, very diverse for us. Um, and again, I think this is super important. 16% were MSM. Just really important because there's just this assumption out there. You know, you're in the ACI, it's all going to be ID related and not, not true. And here, you know, 48% risk not specified because people don't want to admit necessarily ID or they're not going to necessarily, this is not a, um, this is a coercive environment. And there's a whole, the whole, the ethics of doing research within the correctional setting is huge and critically important, but it is a coercive environment. So people are like, I'm sorry, I, I don't trust that you're going to use this information, that you will not use this information to hurt me. Now, there is some good news. This is the number of newly diagnosed infections over the, uh, this nine year period. And really, you're seeing you know, an 80% reduction. It's just extraordinary. And some of this is related to the decrease in IDU related HIV that we've seen nationally and that we've seen in Rhode Island. And I'll show you a slide on this later on. We've had a 90% decrease in IDU related HIV in Rhode Island. How, it's sort of a tough thing because as HIV researchers, I don't know, we're, we, we, it's a little funny because we're always trying to get more resources and do a better job, but this is a huge success and I think it's something we need to really tout. And, and, and people often think, well, you know, we thought, I would have thought, you know, IDUs are going to be most refractory change. That's totally not the case. And of course, IDUs, like anybody else, first and foremost are people. And this gets to the whole problem, how we approach the whole HIV epidemic. The fact we label people, MSM, CSWs, IDUs, is I think inherently very offensive. You know, we all want to be identified by how we self-identify. You know, I'm, you know, a concert pianist, I'm not. But if I was, I would definitely identify myself as that because I would be so impressed with myself. But um, the bottom line is we don't, Sort of this is an odd aberration of the HIV epidemic that we define ourselves by our, you know, um, whether it's sexual behavior, drug use behavior. I mean, it's really an aberration, um, so not very good. Now, jails are really where the money's at in many ways. And this really is, you know, a uh, slide from some of our jail systems, which are just really horrendous. They can be super overcrowded, they can be violent, really tough places to work. And security is always the most important consideration of the system. They don't care about health. It's not part of their agenda. And so it's really difficult to work in these systems, but it's super worthwhile and, and super important. The interface between corrections and substance abuse is, is very strong, as we've talked about. This is drug arrests over time. So you see, you know, who is it that's incarcerated? About half of men and women meet criteria for alcohol and drug dependence. So, um, you know, we talk about substance abuse as a medical illness, which it is, but we don't treat it as such. You know, a, over 50% are under the influence during, the, during their offense, and the, it is drug involved if they're not actually drug using. So this is, you know, so closely interfaced together. So if, if this is the case, why is it that we don't have good substance abuse treatment programs within the correctional setting? Well, how do you do it? It's really a hard thing. You know, substance abuse treatment by its nature has to be voluntary or has to have a voluntary component. And it's an interesting question. But in terms of the reading, in terms of NIDA, in terms of our long-term outcomes, this is 
really critically important. We know that sexual use, sexual behavior, um, substance use behavior, the overlap is huge. We tend to talk about IDU and stimulants, whether it's methamphetamines or cocaine, but alcohol is a key driver of the epidemic. And particularly in some of the work we're doing overseas in Ukraine, some of the work in the Caribbean and Latin America and Africa, alcohol is really critically important. So there's no way you can work within the correctional system if you don't have some type of partnership. And the partnership is both administration, with the health sector, and with folks that are interested in really trying to intervene. This, interestingly enough, is a poster that the inmates did when we started our HIV testing program where they identified themselves as HIV peer counselors and we're talking about the window period. This is the window, the window period and the importance of retesting. And it was just so interesting and, and fun and effective to have the um, inmate engagement. And how you do that is, is challenging, but really super important. And this is really hard to do, particularly with the system, which is always against it, always uniformly. So things are challenging. You'll go out there to do your interviews. You'll go out there to meet, and the whole place is being locked down. They won't. You, they'll just say, "I'm sorry, nobody come in. It's locked down." Why is it locked down? They'll tell you, "Oh, well, we have a security situation." Well, they might really have a security situation. They may have searched the cells and found, you know, a knife, but maybe that they're just short staffed, and they decide they want to do it. It might be that they don't like the fact you're coming in, and they're just going to make life difficult for you. And the first couple times you go in. It definitely will treat you like dirt. So their goal is to intimidate you. Correctional systems don't like outsiders coming in. They don't like it. Why? Because we treat people differently. You know, you all know the um, studies done where the, the where the the um, change in our own in our own attitudes and our own behavior due to the criminal justice system occurs you know naturally. And when you're an outsider, which can humanize the system when you're going in and out, where there's a huge value to that. It's another set of eyes, and there's an inherent accountability going on there. That is a very good thing. So you will have resistance, and it will be difficult to do. But the impact can be huge. And the, I use this as an example, because this is the decrease in HIV among IDUs in Rhode Island. This was 1990 to 2003. And this is raw, this is number, this is the number of new HIV diagnoses statewide. It's kind of interesting. And this is the raw number of HIV diagnoses among IDUs. So it turns out that early on, there's very little testing and needle exchange, needle use and reuse in Rhode Island was at all time high. The correctional system in Rhode Island, they considered it was a felony to possess one needle and it had a five year sentence. So if you had some cocaine and three needles on you, it was much easier to just go ahead and charge you with three felonies for each needle, and that means you get up to a 15-year sentence because of the needles, didn't even worry about the cocaine. We won't even test it. You know, it's just simpler and easier to do. On average, needles were used 20, we went to the detox and um, interviewed injectors, said, you know, how often do you re reuse your needles? On average, they reused their needles 23 times. They would sharpen them on the back of a matchbox um, in order before reusing it. And the reason was because um, the more needles you had, the more uh, the criminal, uh, the, the, the jail time in the sentence. So needle exchange came in, then syringe possession was changed from a felony to a misdemeanor, and then um, syringe possession was legalized. In the HIV world, we do a lot of time, we spend a lot of time talking about needle exchange. I like needle exchange, it's a good thing. How, what has, how has needle exchange done in decreasing HIV among injection drug users? I think, I like the little flame short, terrible. Why? Because what's done it is our pharmacies. I mean, every different neighborhood in America has a church, liquor store, and a pharmacy. A little bit of exaggeration, but you know what I'm trying to say. The pharmacies everywhere. Why? Well, because Medicaid coverage is very broad, and because it covers your, all your medications, and the cost, the margin on these drugstores are off the charts. So that means if you want to distribute needles, 
you know, you can get on your high horse, fuck all about you know change and everything else. That's great, great, great. But if you really want to do it, pharmacies. It's all the pharmacies. And in fact, where are biggest interventions going to be down the line? And the pharmacies. The medical system stinks in terms of access, getting to it. It's difficult timing. The pharmacies. The pharmacies are where it's at. And in Rhode Island, we got CVS. Second largest pharmacy, what's the largest pharmacy chain in the country? Walgreens. So first you got Walgreens, second you got CVS. CVS is based in Rhode Island. Amazing what you could do. One of the largest primary care networks, sorry, not primary care, care networks are the pharmacy minute clinics. CVS uses minute clinics, Walgreens calls it something else, I forget what they call it. But these, these clinics where you can stop in. Now, do they do HIV testing? They wouldn't at, um, at CVS. Will they do STD testing? I don't think so, but it's really interesting where we need to go and where how we need to think about. It. But you know, this drop in absolute number of, of cases of IDUs, and this is persisted, is unbelievable. It's really extraordinary. So that is accounted for some of the dramatic decrease in HIV among um, within the correctional setting. Language. You know, we talked about this in the beginning. Language and how we talk about IDUs, and how we talk about drug use, how we talk about HIV, this whole way that we um, depersonalize it is really dehumanize it is really, I think, is really very, very, very destructive. The marginalization of our communities and the isolation is just totally normalized. And that means the support that we take for granted doesn't exist, the confidentiality that we think is inherent to each person really don't have that opportunity. And you, you really have to consider this in a very um, important way in order to get the trust and the buy-in of your participants in your study. You have to meet folks where they're at. I always thought HIV was their biggest concern. Early on, before we had a, a colleague of mine who was a woman doing HIV care, I was taking care of all the HIV positive women. And you know, I'm an ID doc. Their number one concern has got to be HIV. It wasn't. It's their kids. What's going on with their kids? And if they're inside, where are their kids? On the other hand, I remember asking, telling one woman who I knew well on the outside, I said, oh, I'm really sorry you're here. She said, Dr. Flying, I'm so glad I'm here. If I wasn't here, I think I would be dead. And the, in fact, one of, in the, back in you know, the early 2000s, one of our, um, and HIV, in fact, the woman we'd been caring for, who'd been out of prison, was won a scholarship by one of the drug companies given by one of the drug companies to go to one of the international AIDS conferences, which is a big to do, a big, big, big to do, and pretty big. It costs a lot of money and it's a big to do. She went shopping, the, 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 the liaison with the drug company came up and went shopping ahead of time by all sorts of clothes and get ready for it. Two weeks beforehand, um, she was dead and her body was announced in Providence. And, you know, died drug overdose, died violent death, died suicide, we were never really sure that the combination, but just so, 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 so sad. So our concern is HIV, but that's not necessarily their, their number one concern. And it was amazing to me how for many of them really was, you know, their kids and what was happening for them. You know, 95% of folks get released. We always think they're in prison. That's where they are, we need to meet them there. Yes, we need to start working with them, yes. But that's not the end of the story, that's really just the beginning. So folks come in and they go out. So the number of individuals released from jail each year, nine million, it's quite extraordinary. And the rates of HIV, Hep B, Hep C, TB, STDs, addiction, mental illness, hypertension, asthma, cirrhosis, this is really a syndemic, which has been well described within younger MSM, less well described in this community. It's a whole person. And unfortunately, in our research world, and to get your research grants funded, you need to be narrow, you need to be focused like a laser point. But at the end of the day, those aren't individuals. The individuals suffer from the burden of all these diseases. And if we approach them as a, a carrier of a disease, as a vector of disease, we're going to really fail. So you have to have a person-centered approach. I mean, a young 
individual, say young MSM, dabbling with drug use, very high risk sex, and we're able for that to help that person say HIV negative with the use of PrEP, but you don't address, you do not address their mental health and they, you know, commit suicide, but yet they're HIV negative, you know, mission is not accomplished. And that's not that uncommon. So, you know, we really, we're caught, we're really caught because as academics, in order to get funded, you're not gonna get funded with a person-centered approach. It's not gonna work. You've gotta have your, um, you've gotta have your hypothesis, you've gotta have your, you know, really well-designed, laser-sharp research um, study, and it really should focus on very few good, hard endpoints. That's gonna make the big difference. On the other hand, that's not what's at the center of it all. What's at the center of all is the individual. Okay, so how are we doing with folks being released from prison? Well, really poorly in general. This is a study that was done in Texas. This was done a little while ago. This was 2,000 individuals being released from the Texas Department of Corrections. The ADAC program existed, but they didn't link it up very carefully. And they found that 90% of four former inmates had treatment interruptions. This was 2004 to 2007. So they looked at prescription refills. 5% filled their prescription within 10 days of being released from, from the system. 18% within 30 days and 30% within 60 days. So that means 70% didn't even fill their scripts. That means they were not continuing, continuing their heart, their HIV medications. That means they were not getting good ongoing viral suppression. And we can pre we've, the data clearly shows individuals increase their risk behaviors upon release. So therefore, you're gonna have more HIV transmission. So from a continuum of care point of view, from an HIV prevention point of view, it's really a disaster. Now I just reviewed a paper from Jade's, this is really interesting, where the group at UNC got together with a group from Texas and they just did a randomized control study. They looked at individuals being released from prison. Everybody in both systems had ADAC. Okay, everybody knows what ADAC is? AIDS Drug Assistance Program, HIV meds. Okay. Everybody in both systems had a case manager help relate, to help connect them with, um, with a clinic and with a uh, pharmacy. Then, in the control arm, they gave them all a cell phone, okay, with minutes, just a flip phone, not a smartphone. And in the intervention arm, they did four different sessions in person. Then they did eight connected sessions on the outside, either by phone or in person. And then they used the cell phone for text reminders. Really well-designed study. In both conditions, the standard and in the intervention arm, 60% of individuals connected with HIV care within two weeks and maintained on medications, and over a, a slightly higher percentage maintained viral suppression with less than 50 copies of HIV per milliliter of blood. And they said, this is a negative study. Our intervention did not work. And I just sent the review back and I said to them, I'm sorry, you guys are wrong. That response, where 60% connected, and in one arm 64%, in the other arm 68%, not statistically significant difference, maintain viral suppression, that is wildly successful. That's huge, and that's so good. So, I'm sorry guys, you designed a really amazing study, but in the standard arm, you had ADAP, you gave discharge planning and you gave everybody a cell phone. I'm sorry, that's a huge intervention. And then there's the study intervention. The study intervention was meeting with the research assistant and doing a CASI, um, a CASI a audio computer assisted um, uh, assessment of both uh, all the different measures that they did. That standard is huge and that connected this work. And if you compare that to this historical control, which was Texas from 2004 to 2007, wildly successful. So I said, we are making really good progress in that regard. And I would interpret this study as both arms were, were highly effective. Okay, so continuity care is, is really critical. It's super difficult to do. Substance abuse is, um, is so heavily prevalent. 
we made the assumption early on in our own bridge program, which I'll show you that the folks that were absent would link with care, and the folks that started to reuse would not link with care. And we found that was not the case, that folks did link with care even though they reused. One of the big issues now is medication-assisted therapies, whether it's buprenorphine-based, whether it's methadone-based, but it's a high risk of drug overdose. And we've seen this, I don't know if you've seen this in Chicago, but folks coming out, reusing, and they reuse at the same rate that they were using before they came in. They've lost all their tolerance, and, and they um, overdose, um, and it's really dreadful. Sometimes even if only in jail for a short time. Mm -hmm. So, yes. folks, and I don't know what it's like, do you guys, what happens in Puerto Rico, or what happens in Chicago if you're on methadone, or if you're on buprenorphine, do they continue, or do they? Largely not. No. They don't continue. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll taper you off. It mm -hmm. depends on the system that someone's in, but they don't. Okay, so here we have medication-assisted therapies, which are part of medical care, and we take folks off the, from the correctional system. Even pregnant women. Sorry? Even pregnant women are taken, taken off. Taken off. Taken off. Yeah. So this is just, you know, this is really, it's, and it, it's really, it, it's really horrendous. Um, Post-release priorities, antiretroviral therapy, being networked in housing, substance abuse, children, transportation, the one that we find most difficult is housing. If you don't have stable housing, it's most difficult and really hard. So I can't resist ending these here. This is the fellow who got me involved in correctional work at the very, very beginning. And this is a fellow who did substance abuse treatment work for about 30 years before anybody else did it in Fall River, Mass. Uh, Frank Pro and he was really a hero. Um, well, stop there. Thanks.